بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم بلیف ان گاڈ بائی فار دا موسٹ سگنیفکنٹ بلیف دیٹ مسلمس آر ایکسپیکٹڈ ٹو ایکنالج اینڈ اینڈ کنفرم از بلیف ان گاڈ وائی شوڈ ون بلیو ان گاڈ ان آڈر ٹو آنسر دس کوشچن فرام a Quranic perspective, it's important to first understand and agree to the sources we humans have that we employ to get information that we believe is correct, that we acknowledge as a reality. There are essentially four sources of knowledge that humans have with them which they make use of in order for them to be able to confirm that a certain piece of information is a reality. They have intuition. They have sense perception. they have uh, intellectual reasoning and they have divine revelation let's take intuition first all humans have come to this world with a clear understanding of certain realities that they already know they know a priori they know intuitively for instance we have moral judgment we understand from inside that the certain things certain expectations which are morally important binding and there are certain other things which are morally despicable unacceptable The entire humanity shares a long list of uh, such do's and don'ts. We have an aesthetic sense which leads us to conclude that there are certain things which look good, beautiful, attractive. There are certain other things which are ugly, are not attractive. and uh, therefore we don't like them there's something from inside that tells us that you know the certain things which are good aesthetically and certain things are not that's true for not just objects that we can see but other things as well poetry statement etc likewise you know we have this concept of something which is complete some other projects ideas which are incomplete we have an already given understanding which enables us to conclude uh, moral judgments aesthetic sense aesthetic conclusions as well as uh, understanding of what is whole and what is part the quran tells us that quite the same way we also have an appreciation and understanding of god deeply embedded inside our personalities so we are born with an understanding of god and the quran also tells us the reason why we have that understanding it mentions in verse 172 of surah al araf the 7th surah chapter of the quran that the almighty assembled all humans who were to come to this world he assembled them put them together and asked this question alastu bi rabbikum am i not your lord qalu bala they all said why not we acknowledge it and the almighty mentioned that i have done it this exercise 
so that tomorrow on the day of judgment you may not be able to say that we didn't know it and it were our parents who went wrong and ascribed partners with God. Are you going to punish us for what others did? In other words, the Almighty is telling us that we humans know God intuitively. It is because of this reason, according to the Quran, that those who do not believe in one God, they, when they are confronted with difficulties which push them to a very tight corner, um, they also seek help from one God. This is because that one God is residing deeply inside our personalities. The second source of uh, knowledge that we humans, all humans share is uh, the knowledge that we get through sense perception. We've got five senses through which uh, we are able to perceive realities. We see, we hear, we touch, we smell and we taste. And we are able to come to the conclusion that these indeed are realities. Another way that sense perception is able to let us know about realities is uh, the history that is given to us from the earlier generations. Um, our ancestors, our forefathers and people around the world, they experienced certain realities perceived them through their, through their sense perception and uh, we didn't perceive them but then they did it and this information got transmitted to us through history, legends, folklores. Some of the information is so definite, so undeniable that uh, all humans acknowledge that information. The information which is commonplace, which is unanimously agreed to. The reason is that it's accepted as a principle that a very large number of people spread across the globe together would not say the same thing, uh, talk about the same event, incident, unless it actually happened. I mean, you can talk about something which never happened as a reality and fool a few people. But you cannot fool the entire humanity. You cannot fool everyone else. Uh, so, that is also sense perception of the earlier generations. Uh, you know, we, for example, know that Alexander the Great was uh, an emperor who actually conquered a good part of this globe. Uh, likewise, we know about Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, etc. You know, information about them is so well known and it's so widespread that it's difficult to imagine that it was wrong, it was false and concocted. Likewise, the Quran tells us over and over again that there was an interaction between God and uh, the ancestors, the great, great, great forefathers of the entire humanity. That is Adam and Eve. The Quran mentions in uh, verse 35 of Surah Al-Baqarah and on a number of other occasions uh, that Adam and Eve the pair which was the first pair of humanity from whom the entire humanity then emerged, proceeded, they had a first-hand direct interaction with God. Did they see him? Well, I don't know. I, I can't confirm. Did they hear him? Uh, probably yes. And 
you know they were there living in a garden and they went through many experiences which uh, uh, the quran mentions which took place and uh, then they were ultimately it was decided that they're going to leave that garden along with satan and they started living in this world they had children probably grandchildren children as well in their lifetime i don't know maybe even one one more generation uh but obviously they had time together plenty of time they had very few activities that would have demanded their uh, engagement that would take members of the family away from each other so they spent a lot of time together and they had good ages what exactly must they have been talking about well there's no doubt about the fact that one of the most frequently discussed topics must have been the interaction that adam and eve had with god in the garden when they left this world how is it possible that the kids must not have shared the story of their parents with their kids with their children and the children must not have their children uh, would not have shared that information with the next generation and so on what i'm trying to say is that this experience of the very first couple of mankind spread across the entire humanity because it was a real experience and therefore we have everywhere in this world where no matter wherever we go an understanding of god the names are different but there is a concept and understanding of a creator this it seems is because humans were well, the very first humans had a first hand experience of god which then was transmitted to other generations through basically verbal uh, communication and uh, obviously it took other forms of communication as well later on then we move on to the third source of knowledge which is uh, intellectual reasoning intellectual reasoning means that we humans have all of us have a faculty within us which enables us to take the data that we have the information that we have into account we analyze it we categorize information and we draw conclusions this faculty is called the faculty of intellect intellect doesn't have information on its own it draws information from uh, well from intuition and from sense perception so we already have a few realities inside us by birth as i mentioned and then we see around and we hear and we smell and we touch and we taste many realities intellect analyzes them puts them together in categories and uh, then draws conclusion conclusions which are considered real a simple example of uh, a reality that intellect is able to to help humans to to realize to know is uh, the reality of fire which uh, an observer not now but i'm talking about uh, some earlier times where when there weren't any tractors any factories etc it was a very simple uh, you know times of humans where they had not made industrial scientific technological progress a man is looking at a sm- at smoke billowing somewhere uh, on top of a 
of a forest. And just merely by observing smoke, he comes to the conclusion that there must have been some fire that has erupted, causing uh, smoke to below. This is intellect. The fire has not been seen, but intellectual reasoning has enabled humans to come to the conclusion that what is not visible is real. So there are many other conclusions that humans have been able to, to draw as a consequence of using their intellect. I did talk about gravity, I talked about intelligence, I talked about love and you can talk about a number of other conclusions that you can draw intellectually. Now what the Quran does is that the book of God attracts the attention of humans and asks them to use these faculties of sense perception that they have. They should see around their uh, environment and uh, observe for, for themselves what's going on, the way this world is operating. So the Quran does attract our attention and points at a number of uh, real things that we have in this world and inclines us to conclude that there is, for instance, number one, discipline in this world. That is, what we see around us is a system that is enabling the world that we are living in to function in a manner that there seems to be control, discipline. We know, for instance, uh, that at any particular day, in any place in this world, the sun is going to rise at a definite time, given already known. Likewise, the sun is going to set at the appointed time. We know, for instance, that uh, if a farmer sows seeds in the soil, um, uses fertilizers also, for example, and then uses water to, to enable the crops to come up, to emerge, the farmer is confident given the fact that the sun is going to blaze and its rays are going to fall on the soil and hopefully rain is also going to fall and as a result of uh, the interaction, interplay of these uh, different aspects of nature, crops are going to emerge. We do observe that the world that we are living in, there are heavenly bodies. The sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, the moons. They are numerous. They are all moving. And yet, they are all moving in their own respective orbits and there are no accidents. There are no explosions, big disasters happening in this world. This cannot happen accidentally uh, because we know from our own experiences of humans, for instance, that on our roads in Lahore, Karachi, etc., there is chaos, there is indiscipline. Uh, we have far too many traffic jams than there ought to be. But on the other hand, in many of the other better civilized cities, cities of the civilized world, you know, London, New York, etc., the traffic is far more disciplined. Now, people come from our countries cannot come up with an explanation that it's all a fluke, it's happening without any reason. Uh, the fact is that those nations who have been able to come up with discipline in their traffic have worked hard at it, they've planned it and they have come up with rules and regulations which are followed because they are made to be followed 
for there to be discipline. So we have likewise strict discipline, control in the world that we are living in. That's one observation that the Quran would want us to conclude. The other one is that there is presence of uh, providence. Discipline or control is Qudrat. Providence is Rububiyat. What it actually means is that this control that we observe in the world that we are living in, it could be for many other reasons. We don't know. Probably we don't care. But one thing is certain. This system that we are a part of enables us to survive. In actual fact, to thrive. You know, we as humans have numerous needs. We need food, we need water, we need other drinks, we need air to breathe, we need a temperature which is neither too high nor too low. And lo and behold, all these and many other needs that we humans have in order for us to survive, they're there. They're being provided. So there is providence in the system that we are a part of. Nobody can deny it. Likewise, we have in our system mercy. You know, there is one thing called justice. You get what you deserve. You did something and, you know, you deserve to get something in return. Commensurate. Equal in value or importance or whatever. But then there is mercy. There is uh, the possibility that you get what you don't deserve. That's what mercy is. So what we observe in this world, in this life of ours is that the system of this life is merciful as well. We are getting things we didn't deserve. I mean, life, for example, is what we didn't deserve. And it's not that we don't like our life. We love it. We would, we wouldn't want to die. We would not like to part with our life nor of our dear ones. But die we must. So what we, what we feel is that the world that we are living in is a world that is also giving us an indication that there is this presence of mercy, us getting things more than what we deserve. And last but not the least, we have in the world that we are a part of wisdom. We see that this world of ours uh, is running according to a certain plan. Uh, there are projects, there are goals, and then there is planning done in order for those goals to be attained, to be achieved. Humans, in order for them to be able to survive, when they come to this world as children, infants, they are vulnerable. They depend on a number of factors so much. They need so many things desperately that if they're not provided them with, they wouldn't be able to survive. And they need attention. They need attention not just for the first two days, for years, if that attention is not provided to them, they would survive. And the fact of the matter is that even before they come to this world, there is already arrangement for them, waiting for them to come, waiting desperately. The mother, the father, the family, you know, there's this concern, there is love, there is uh, within the parents and the other members of the family, uh, this... Uh, very strong feeling of attachment to every new child that comes to this world. So there is planning. There is what you call wisdom in this world, which you can see for yourself. All these observations of control, of providence, of 
mercy, wisdom, and much more. For an intelligent mind, intelligent, sensitive individual are a puzzle. If there is no answer to it, then the individual must, must be puzzled. Like uh, in a jigsaw puzzle, you know, children are given pieces, broken pieces of one big complete picture, but broken in order for the kids to be able to put those pieces together and form the image of which these pieces were a part. And, uh, you know, when, I, when a child is able to come with the complete picture, that picture is the real one. And uh, the game is over. Likewise, this world that we are living in is also it seems as if pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. You see control. You see, you observe providence, mercy, wisdom. If somebody who doesn't have a clear understanding of what is, what is it all about, then he ought to be really confused, looking for the answer, right answer. The Quran says, the right answer to this puzzle is Allah Samawati Balad. God, that is belief in God, is the light of the heavens and the earth. That is, when you believe in God, it's only then that you are able to understand what is the real solution to this puzzle. Without believing in God, you cannot understand anything. This whole life, the way it has been designed, is actually inviting our intellect to understand what the answer to this whole uh, mystery of life is. So, divine revelation, the fourth source of knowledge, is what enables humans to get confirmation of what they already have in their intuition, of what they can learn through history, which is a part of sense perception uh, as a consequence of uh, the experience of Adam and Eve. And divine revelation also uh, more significantly attracts the attention of our, our intellect. It employs our intellect, invites the attention of our intellect to come to the conclusion that the world that we are living in is a world that was created by and is being run by a God who is uh, strong, powerful, who is a provider, he has providence as his attribute, who is merciful, who is wise and who has a number of other attributes. Now that I have presented before you the case of belief in God from uh, a Quranic perspective. Let's move on to find out how can we attain God's proper appreciation once we have acknowledged that God is there, He is present, He is the Creator. That obviously is not the end of the story. In fact, that's where the challenge begins from. How can we come close to God? How can we appreciate Him properly? When we read the Quran, we find that in our endeavor to come close to God, there are two limitations. One, that we cannot see Him. And two, there is none similar to Him. So, we'll need to understand, appreciate and come close to God given these two limitations. As far as the first limitation goes, we are informed in uh, Surah Al-Araf through a story of Moses, Musa alayhi salam. He uh, wanted to see God. It's quite understandable 
why did he want to see him everybody wants to see him obviously but in his case uh, it was even more evident because he had only recently talked to god you know some kind of a voice is what he heard which he knew was the voice of god he felt that probably now and rightly so is the next step for him to uh, you know ask for god to be viewed to be seen but there was a very firm answer from god and that was lantarani you can't see me instead you look at that mountain if uh, the mountain is able to keep its position then you might be able to see me so it so happened that the almighty manifested his glory on the mountain and uh, it turned into small pieces of fine dust and uh, musa fell unconscious and when he got up he recovered he said glory be to you please accept my repentance and i am the first of the believers that is i believe that you cannot be seen so god cannot be seen the other thing is that uh, there is no one similar to god so if we can't see him then we probably might have thought that we might see somebody else who is similar to god and get an idea of how god looks like but the quran clarifies that uh, we can't even we, we can't do that because there's none similar to him it is in surah shura surah 42 verse 11 that the almighty mentions laysa kamithlihi shay'un there is no one like him neither in abilities nor in appearance so then how to come close to god how to know him more how to appreciate him i hope that you you do appreciate the fact that you know when you come to realize that there is a god you would like to know more about him and you would like to come close to him well i, I think we, we would like to talk to him so the answer given to us by the quran is that there is only one way and no other that we can understand appreciate and come close to god and that is through an understanding and appreciation of god's attributes we cannot see or imagine his physical presence that's ruled out somebody might claim that uh, we can see him in our dreams not at all had that been the case then probably the first person who would have been given this privilege should have been moses musa alayhi salam but no it's not possible so the only way out for us in this worldly life and believe you me it's a very exciting thing that we can get into in order to come close to god is to understand appreciate imagine and mold ourselves adjust ourselves in accordance with god's attributes so we are informed that god has a number of attributes great attributes justice mercy power wisdom and many more and the more we know them by imagining and experiencing their presence in our lives the more we can come close to him but there are three aspects of uh, god attributes that we must be aware of uh, which make his attributes different from the attributes of us humans and uh, quite obviously many of his attributes are the ones that we also have uh, you know we have some sense of justice and we are also sometimes merciful and powerful at times etc however one aspect of god regarding attributes is that he has got all the good attributes all the good imaginable attributes are in god the other is that all his attributes are unlimited infinite and the third is all his attributes are 
simultaneously functional. So these three aspects of God's uh, attributes make his attributes, despite them being similar to ours in some ways, are, are very different. The first thing, all the good attributes belong to God. It is said in Surah Bani Israel, 17 Surah, chapter, verse 110. The Almighty says, Tell them, you call for, call him Allah, Avidur Rahman, or you call him Rahman. Doesn't really, really make any difference. Why? Ayyamma tadruhu. Call him by any name. Falahul asmaul husna. For him are all the good names. Names of the Almighty are actually reflections of his attributes. God is Ar-Rahman, which reflects his attribute of mercy. He is uh, Al-Hakim, which reflects his uh, attribute of wisdom, etc. So, call him by any name. He's got all the good names. The second thing is that God's attributes are unlimited. This understanding emerges from the fact that no matter what name God is called by in the Quran, which obviously is reflecting one attribute or another, it's preceded by the letter Al, which is somewhat the equivalent of the in English. And one aspect of uh, uh, this uh, addition to the word, to any noun, uh, when it is preceded by Al is that it gives the meanings of uh, completeness, of uh, perfection. So, we humans can also be Sami. We can also be the ones who listen. But God is As-Sami. Uh, we can also be Aleem, knowing, knowledgeable. But God is Al-Aleem, you know, perfectly knowledgeable, perfectly hearing. There is no, there is no limitation in what he can hear and what he can't, etc. The third aspect is that his attributes are simultaneously functional operative. This understanding of his uh, attributes emerge from uh, the fact that when the Quran mentions God's attributes, many a times those attributes are mentioned in a way that they are not having any conjunctions dividing them. They all come together. So the manner they appear simultaneously, uh, the same way they are simultaneously operative in reality. So uh, a famous passage in Surah Al-Hashr, 59th Surah, chapter of the Quran, beginning from uh, verses 22 to 24, which is the last verse of uh, the chapter, We've got a number of uh, uh, attributes of the Almighty and I'll just mention some of them to give you an idea that they all have been mentioned together and they are all available functioning together. So, you know, uh, these attributes, they are mentioned all together. Uh, is the creator, the evolver, the modeler, his are the most beautiful names. Uh, so that's another important aspect. Now, knowing the aspects of God, his, his attributes, they enable us to understand certain complex realities better. We talked about it earlier in the last uh, lecture that uh, God is uh, the one who knows everything and this causes people to have a problem regarding the issue of predestination. Uh, when everything is known beforehand or written beforehand, what's the purpose? I mean, what is our role? But if you bear in mind that God 
knows everything that's one aspect of him that's because he's knowledgeable and perfectly knowledgeable let's not forget the fact that he's also fair and just and completely just that is simultaneously happening or this attribute is functioning so when god has put his uh, humans into a trial he would not be unfair in the trial so on the one hand he is knowledgeable and therefore he knows beforehand what we are going to do on the other hand what we do actually is what we do on our own volition we do what we think we want to do we use our freedom and nobody pushes at us to do one thing or the other now that's what you know is possible for us to do when we look at things realities from the point of view of uh, god's attributes and their different aspects that we have discussed another problem sometimes people are confronted with is that they either emphasize mercy a bit too far and feel that because god is merciful therefore he is going to forgive and therefore there's no need for us to be too serious about our moral performance the other extreme is that god is fair and just and therefore there is no possibility for us to be able to succeed in the next next life to be able to succeed in the test that the almighty has required us to go through the fact of the matter is that if we put the two attributes together and imagine that they both simultaneously functioning uh we get a picture wherein we find that on the one hand god is merciful on the other hand he is also fair and just put them together he is fair and just therefore he is going to consider the case of each and every human on the basis of the same principles in other words he is not going to be biased in favor of some and against others he is going to treat each human exactly the same way the same on the basis of the same principles of justice but because he is also merciful his principles of justice are not going to require his creatures humans to pass the test of this trial in a way that the margin benchmark the passing marks are very stringent and difficult he is going to lower the bar so to say and enable more and more people to be able to go through the test successfully those who will not succeed will not deserve his mercy but those who will succeed the lenient easy possibility of uh, attaining the passing marks no matter who it's going to be everyone who will be provided with the same opportunity of uh, succeeding so that's what happens when you understand god's attributes and you are able to apply them to some complex issues that people have in mind when they talk about god and the trial of this life there are two basic expressions that we find in the quran and hadith which if we express properly with a proper understanding we it is as if have said almost everything that can be said about god in a nutshell those two expressions are subhanallah and alhamdulillah one expression is negative it negates all possibilities of errors weaknesses flaws in god that's subhana subhanallah that's why when we read in the quran uh, this as uh, this statement that these people they say qalu takhazallahu walada god has had a son or has had children subhana he is free from all errors how can he have children he won't get old he wouldn't die it's people who get old or who have the fear of dying who need children so that they can take care of them when they're old and they would replace them and continue the traditions of their family after they die but god has no errors no flaws 
And the second expression is Alhamdulillah. God has got all the good attributes. He has all uh, the great possibilities that we can imagine of. So when we say Alhamdulillah, we are talking positively about God that he's got all the great attributes. When we say Subhanallah, we talk negatively and negating all possibilities of weaknesses and errors in God Almighty. Now, I started the discussion, uh, this part of the discussion, by saying, how can we come close to God? The answer is that when we know God's attributes and we, when we apply them on us, we will know that the Almighty is running this world through his attributes. In other words, um, it's one aspect of his attribute or another which is affecting us at some point in time in some areas of our lives. And when we are able to identify the right attribute and imagine that attribute and its manifestation, we really feel close to God, not physically, but spiritually, emotionally. For example, one of the important attributes of God is that he is knowledgeable. And he is knowledgeable of what? Of everything. He knows what I am doing right now. He knows what my intentions are. He knows everything. He knows what I do uh, when I'm talking to the people. He knows what I do when I am all alone. He knows what I do in the light of the day and in the darkness of night. You know, when you start imagining the application of this attribute, you know, you, you start feeling responsible. At times, you know, when you're conscious of the presence of God, you are ashamed of yourself uh, as to why you're doing what you're doing. Um, at times, you feel like talking to him because you know that he's listening to you. He's there. Uh, God has the attribute of uh, wisdom. So, you know, in life, you try your best. You do things according to the plan that you have in mind, but then you don't get what you want to get. You have a feeling that things are going wrong. Your expectations are not getting fulfilled. You imagine that God is wise. He is running the show. No decision of him could be wrong. So, you know, you adjust yourself to God's attribute of wisdom and you feel comfortable. You know that God is forgiving. So, even if you have done things very wrong, you still don't feel like giving up. You know, you, you realize that what you've done is wrong. You feel embarrassed and you seek God's forgiveness and you feel confident that he's forgiving. Likewise, you know that God is, has control over everything. You know that uh, he listens to everything. So you pray to him. You pray to him with the confidence that he is listening to you and you're confident that he can do everything. So you come close to God uh, by uh, asking him for help. So, that's how we can come close to God. The more we understand God's attributes and the more we apply them to our lives, the more we are going to be able to come close to God.